Hi folks, I'm Vanessa Socket. I'm a computer scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. We are going to have some fun today and talk about scheduling to application containers in Kubernetes, a talk that I like to call pancake elasticity. Let's get started. So let's start with a question. Probably those of you that are running workloads on HPC or you want to run the cloud, you're interested in this question, how do we schedule workloads in Kubernetes? So let's look at different levels of scheduling. So I have been immensely interested in scheduling, not just from an HPC standpoint recently with our scheduler flux framework, but also with Kubernetes. And I've noticed there's different tricks that you can do. So if you just deploy a vanilla Kubernetes, you are going to get the kube scheduler. And the kube scheduler has a pretty kind of framework that they call it an interesting design where you have a single queue of pods, well, an active queue, and you're basically going to move those pods through your active queue, and they're going to hit each of these different endpoints. So you might have different plugins installed. There's something called in-tree plugins and out-of-tree plugins. The in-tree plugins are like hard-coded in the Kubernetes code base. The out-of-tree plugins you get with something called a custom scheduler plugin. So a custom scheduler plugin allows you as the developer to instantiate any of these functions and then to kind of get a hook into the scheduling cycle to, to influence something that happens along the way as you have your little pods traveling along here. And so the best example to give is called co-scheduling. This comes with the scheduler plugins repository where you might start building. And this is basically uh, going to help you create groups of pods. Our scheduler, our custom scheduler is called Fluence and we're gonna be talking a little bit about both today. So let's look at Kube Scheduler. I'm gonna go right into the challenges because if it were perfect, why would I give a talk, right? So with Kube Scheduler, the biggest challenge as I see it is that as our community has changed over time, we've gone from this landscape of like scheduling, you know, databases, web servers, basically like replicating services, very simple stuff where the single queue of pods kind of works to what we call gang scheduling. We wanna schedule groups of pods cool machine learning stuff that orchestrates together. So all of a sudden this unit of operation of the single pod becomes quite challenging when you have a single queue of pods. So what does co-scheduling do? Because as I mentioned, co-scheduling handles these groups. Co-scheduling makes what is called a pod group, a custom resource. It will be associated with a name, but generally the metadata that you'll find are minimum number of members. When there are enough members to create this group, minimum number of resources, and then of course a schedule timeout. I wanna point out also that all of these timestamps are in seconds, which is very different than HPC land where we might have a many, many different events happen in a second. And this is sort of across the Kubernetes ecosystem, something else that we can talk about. So what does this mean practically? It means that when you install this plugin, you create your pod group, you give it a name. So for example, this one is called AMG and then you associate it with your pods via a label. So this could be explicitly a pod, but could also be a template for a pod that will get turned into a pod. Then in co-scheduling, so one of these functions is called sort, specifically Q sort, and it does exactly that. So if you look in the co-scheduling code, what it's basically going to do is provide a less function, and this less function, you can imagine it being applied across pods in that active queue. And when you compare all pairs of pods, you're gonna get the sorted list. So what exactly are we comparing? Well, we're creating those creation timestamps. And specifically, if you look here, we're creating the creation, we're comparing the creation timestamp of the different groups. So you can kind of see where this might be problematic with the granularity of a second. If you're submitting them really quickly and you have pod groups that are sort of, you have pods that are interleaved because their groups were submitted at the same time according to this second granularity, well, you're gonna get interleaving. And so the reason this is problematic is that in practice, it can lead to clogging. So I've done experiments where I submit them like really batch, like probably no one would ever do this outside of HPC. But as I described, what happens is that, is that because the timestamps look the same, you have multiple pods across different groups that get interleaved, pieces of the groups get scheduled onto nodes, and then because each group requires an exact number of members, for example, for MPI to run, you get partial groups that are both on your nodes, there's no more room for anything else, and you are clogged. And then the scheduling queue kind of keeps going, your cluster's stuck in the state, and you're like, what is going on? So that's a problem. 
Now, the other issue with the design is that you're sort of limited to the function endpoints that are, that are exposed. So this is really great if you just want to add like one particular thing about scoring, but what do you do if you want an entirely different design? And so the best example, of course, is like, I want to schedule groups of pots. Well, that is very hard to do when the unit that is moving through the queue is a single pot. So in practice, you tend to see kind of these, these hacks. I don't, I mean, I don't want to call them hacks, but you see people come up with strategies to figure out how to get the functionality that they need that is limited within this constraint design. And something else very interesting that I actually learned after the fact is that multiple plugin decisions can conflict. So when you kind of boot up your cluster, you start your scheduler, there's actually a list of plugins that you enable and that you disable. And each one within a plugin, there's all of these different endpoints. So when, for example, when I started working on our plugin Fluence, I very naively thought that whatever, whatever nodes that our flexion scheduler decided were the final nodes coming out of pre-filter, those were what the pods would be assigned to. Oh boy, was I wrong. So actually this is for pre-filter, but with pre-filter, what actually happens, and we're gonna look at the code here, and this is, this is why it's really good to do dinner reading. So I, I read the Kubernetes code base during dinner. So I'm reading along and I'm like, okay, here. So by the way, this is in the schedule one.go function in the scheduler module. I'm reading along and I say, okay, we're running our pre-filter functions. That's great. We're getting a list of these uh, this pre-result back. Note above, we have all nodes, which are all of the nodes in the cluster. We can skip this block because we're going to assume that that was successful and something didn't go wrong. We also are going to assume that we didn't get uh, any kind of nominated node because we didn't have anything preemption, so we're going to skip this too. But then, oh no, oh no, down here, <laughs> we set nodes equal to all nodes, and then we're going through all of the nodes across the plugins that were returned in that run pre-filter plugins. So for example, if our custom scheduler flexion said, I'm going to give node one, two, and three to this group, I am very sure about this. Those are the ones that are signed. But then you have another plugin enabled. All of a sudden, it's like a mystery soup mixture of all of those nodes. And then afterwards, when you go into scoring, it might be the case that some of the other plugins decisions are actually higher than the ones that our scheduler chose. And so then all of a sudden you have a difference in state between what your plugin, sorry, your scheduler service uh, fluxion says and what is actually going to happen on the cluster. So that was that was a surprise to me. I didn't know that. Uh, oh no. So along with multiple plugin decisions potentially conflicting, actually the solution to this, what I did is I disabled all of them. And then I only added them back one by one when something was broken and absolutely wouldn't work. So I, we have a very streamlined configuration file when we run Fluence. So ex what exactly does Fluence do? Well, Fluence is actually very similar to co-scheduling in design. The main difference is that we automate the creation of the pod group. So basically you apply your job, a mutating admission webhook then adds the labels for the pod groups. So the pod group reconciler present, can then create the pod group. We then have the pod group. We do the same thing with kind of basing the sorting and kind of the ordering based on the timestamp, but we use a timestamp with better temporal granularity so it's not limited to one second. And then we let uh, Fluxion as a sidecar service, which is the Flux Framework Scheduler, do the scheduling. And then those nodes are definitely chosen and sent out to be actually bound by the kubelet. Well, at least we hope. <laughs> Um, and we can be confident about that because we've disabled the other plugins that have other kinds of filtering. My fluency are looking rather dapper and derpy at the same time today. <laughs> Alrighty, so although, so you can look at this design, you can see that there's many, there's many issues, right? But one thing that I have noticed is that a custom scheduler plugin works really well with the second level of scheduling strategy that I want to talk about today. And that is using a controller. So as an example of a controller, I am going to provide Q. This isn't fair to call it a controller because Q has multiple controllers. It has webhooks, it has custom resources, the workload. It is a much bigger entity than a single controller, but it is a good example of something that is going to intercept what the objects in Kubernetes that you are creating and then mutate them and control them 
to orchestrate a better scheduling experience, if you will. So specifically with Q, this is a pretty cool trick. And I have a document that kind of walks through the design of Q at least as of a couple months ago, if anyone's interested. There is a suspend field on the job that you can set to true that prevents it from going to the scheduler. So we suspend the job. And then what Q can do is it can mutate it. It can you know change topology. It can you know wrap it in a workload. It basically changes it however is needed to control the scheduling. And the reason the experience is really nice is because when I was doing those experiments that were launching like hundreds of jobs at once, so thousands of pods, because it was finally controlling when things actually went to the scheduler, as a user, I had a really nice experience seeing, you know, Kubectl get pods. And it was a neat little set as, a, as opposed to my terminal, like exploding in front of me and, you know, not even, actually the API call, like wouldn't even return quickly. It was a total mess. But one of the issues I see with any of these approaches that is that no matter what you do, you are still ultimately subject to the limitations to get putting your thing, you know, giving it to Kube scheduler. That's where it's going at the end of the day. And yes, you'll do a lot better when you finally control it in, uh, in the way that Q does, but it's still going there. And it may also still get rejected by the kubelet depending on, depending on what you're asking for. The other kind of uh, critique of Q or, or anything general like this is that they're often kind of complex or tricky to set up. You know, ideally you want to like apply a YAML file and like move on with your life, right? But I found that when I was using Q, it took me a couple of tries to get that initial kind of configuration YAML file correct. And I'm still not sure I have it totally right. So when actually now we can take these two approaches, so the controller and then the custom scheduler plugin, we can actually like put a bunch of them together. So the custom scheduler plugin, the controller, uh, custom resource definitions, and you can make an entire scheduling ecosystem. So the best example of this, and probably the most famous for the HPC community, is Volcano, the powerful force that is going to spew magma into the sky in any way. Um, so Volcano is really neat because, as you see here, of course, it has multiple controllers. It has uh, different kinds of admission webhooks. It has a custom scheduler plugin. It also has its own command line control. So I'm, I'm guessing that's pronounced Volcano Control. And then it also has its own representation of job queue and pod group. And their pod group looks a lot like the co-scheduling pod group. So this is really cool and it works really well. But again, a lot of complexity going on here. So to go back to this original question, how do we schedule workloads in Kubernetes? And I didn't tell you this in the beginning, but when we say workload, we're talking about more than one pod. We have moved beyond the days of deploy my Nginx server and we've moved into, I have this complex thing that I want to deploy. Take a look at this for a second. Take a look at, well, this is only three of them. This is Fluence, this is Q, and this is Volcano. But what do you see? I'll tell you what I see. I see a lot of complexity. And when I really kind of step back and, you know, smoke my fake pipe and stroke my beard that I don't have because I can't grow facial hair, obviously, this is the conclusion that I come to. Kubernetes, kind of back in the day when it was designed, it was not designed for this kind of workload scheduling. This does not mean that it's wrong. It, you know, it was designed for what it was designed for at the time, but all of these solutions that we're seeing that have this huge level of complexity, these approaches are trying to get around the limitations of the default scheduler. And every time I look at this ecosystem and tools that are coming around it or I'm just working on it myself, this is the conclusion that I come to. And so I don't have a solution for you today, but I want to encourage you to think about the different strategies that people are using to schedule their workloads, these different levels that we're talking about. I'm gonna be presenting a new one today. And I am very confident that our community will move forward and get to the point where we have very good solutions, but we're kind of in the middle. And guess what? The middle is a really fun part because that is where you get to be creative and experiment and have fun. And that is what we are doing right now. So let's continue. So the third approach that my group has worked on that is a different level, a different strategy for scheduling, I call partition. And so the example of this is the flux operator. And so the basic idea about the partition is that you say, okay, Kubernetes scheduler, I trust you to give me an entire set of nodes that I'm going to partition off. And then I'm going to deploy my own HPC workload manager there. So the flux operator deploys flux framework. And then I'm going to have that workload manager control everything to a much finer grain topology down to 
the socket, down to the PCI bus, down to whatever that particular workload manager and scheduler can do. And so this is the design of the Flux operator. You basically kind of partition off your nodes. There's a, 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 a bunch, each, each, there's a mapping of one pod per node. There's a tree-based overlay network with a lead broker. And so let me, let me be fair and do the same thing I did with the other approaches and just tell you what's wrong with it to start out. So given the current Flux operator design, your cluster, so each of those pods running on one node in the cluster is committed to a container base. So you don't have to install Flux. The original design, you had to install Flux in that container. That's now audited on the fly via an empty directory that's uh, shared in the pod. But you know, if you want to run LAMPs, for example, got to have LAMPs in that container. And my goodness, if you change your mind and you want to add the OSU benchmarks later, well, you should have built it in there to begin with because you're going to have to deploy a different container. Not a huge deal. You could actually just deploy another mini cluster. That's what we do. But it's kind of limiting, right? <laughs> like I would like to be able to switch between applications without having to redeploy my mini cluster. And so maybe, and this is where my thinking went, you know, I guess in the last couple of weeks, because this work is fairly new, I said, maybe there's a design in here that we're missing. Maybe instead of a partition, we can have an elastic partition. So my first idea is like, I want the flux operator with like lots of containers because containers are just kind of like these abstract layers that sit over actual different namespaces of your kernel and like, why can't I have multiple of them that I can somehow intelligently switch between? So this is the idea of pancake elasticity. And I called it pancake elasticity because we can imagine multiple containers stacked up like pancakes. Uh, thank you for this image from Gemini. It's like my favorite new talk generation image tool. So actually I came up with this conceptually before I came up with the implementation. So let's start here. We have containers A through E. They have all of our favorite HPC applications in them. In this pancake elasticity world, I can squash down all of the lower pancakes. So maybe like I ate them and they're in my stomach and they're squished down. And I'm going to use lamps and I'm going to I'm gonna use all the resources on this physical node to run lamps. Then I'm going to change my mind and like kind of like boinging. I'm going to then squish the ones to the top. And instead, I'm going to run stream. And this is on the same node. I'm not redeploying anything. I'm just moving around resources. And then I want to split it half and half. So I have half lamps running and I have half stream running. And I can kind of intelligently change that up however I want without needing to worry that I'm oversubscribing resources. So let me tell you now why that wouldn't work with the current mini cluster design. As I mentioned, you're only deploying one container base with your applications built into the container. And as I also mentioned, we have to ensure that the entire pod, one pod is mapped to one node. The reason is because it, Flux uses HWLock to discover the resources for the node. So if you actually did deploy two containers, then both of them would think that they had double the resources. And I'll show you what that looks like. So here we have our Flux mini cluster. Flux is added on the fly. This is done via an init container that prepares Flux in an empty directory. The empty directory is going to be bound uh, to the pod, to the container in the pod, excuse me. Now, the lead broker is index zero of the job. That is the one that you see at the top here. The tree based overlay network is then going to connect the nodes. So each of those worker nodes is basically going to connect to the lead in port 8050. This is done with a zero MQ bootstrap. We compared this with the MPI operator that does a standard SSH bootstrap. It's a little bit faster. Uh, it's probably trivial when all is said and done. So when you shell into your lead broker and you connect to the socket and you do flux resource list, which is like, show me the resources that I have, you see across your nodes, which where each node is a pod, we can use those interchangeably. Now, Let's step back and think about our pancake design. How do we get more pancakes? I mean, how do we get more applications per physical node? What are our options? Well, the first option, we can install more than one application in the container. We can make a really big pancake, like one really big pancake. So we really decided we don't want to do that. So let's, let's just skip that over. We can use a guaranteed quality of service to actually partition the node into multiple different pod units. So basically to kind of step back, what does that actually mean? You have to deploy your cluster with a static CPU manager policy. 
Then, then you have to set resource uh, limits and requests for CPU and memory across all your containers. That includes init and sidecar containers to say exactly what you want. That is actually going to control the limits via C groups. But here's, here's, the, here's the thing about that. <laughs> So when I tested this on really small sizes, because I'm very cheap when I first test things and I don't want to spend a lot of money, you'll get oom kills a lot. So like the flux operator would be booting up and it would oom kill from like apt get update. And I was like, well, that's not going to work. So if you have a much larger node and that's larger physical node, this isn't going to happen, but you're still committing right to a particular size. Once you set that limit and request, for example, for lamps, if you change your mind in the middle and you say, well, I want to give lamps more resources, I I realized I was wrong. You still have to recreate the mini cluster. So I don't, I don't really see that's a great solution. And I don't really like the, the fragility of the potential of getting, you know, a resource exhaustion because I, I made a bad decision because I make a lot of bad decisions. So yeah, you're still committing one pod or container to a subset of resources a priori. We don't want to do that. <laughs> Alrighty. So let's, let's skip over that option. What's the third one? We could allow more than one broker to run in a pod on a node. Huh. Okay, let's let's walk through this this thinking exercise. So here we have our mini cluster, nine pods each on a node, and we have two flux brokers. Okay, so let's shell in, we'll connect to the socket. There's a physical socket that you can connect to to talk to a broker. We connect to broker blue and we're like, broker blue, tell me the resources that you have. And Broker Blue is like, oh, I have nine nodes and I have 576 cores ready for service. And then you shell into Broker Yellow and you're like, yeah, Broker Yellow, what resources do you have? And Broker Yellow is like, hello, I also have nine nodes and 576 cores. And then you're like, wait a minute. This, you both cannot have the same resources. This is not how it works. You cannot schedule to the same thing. So this, this design, you can see the problem because Flux is basically discovering all the resources on the all the resources on the node with HW lock. That means that you you basically have two schedulers that are going to be scheduling work to the same resources. What does that mean? Oh, over subscription. Dun, 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 dun. Actually, I don't think that's the song for that. Anyway, this this would be very bad. I, I mean, I'm sure this would work for little doopy cases, but generally speaking, when you're running production stuff. You don't want to oversubscribe your resources. So wait a minute, though. As I mentioned, kind of the traditional mini cluster model has the flexion scheduler kind of at the level of the broker conceptually. It's not exactly there. What if, what if we move the scheduler up a level? What if we move it above these two tunes that don't know about each other? And so let me step back for a second and remind you that Flux is a framework. It is called a framework because each of these pieces is modular and we get to be creative and put them together like Legos. And it just happens to be the case that kind of the default way that you set up Flux, you put Flux get kind of flat alongside these other things. But what if, what if we took Mr. Flux get, AKA Fluxion, and we put it above the mini cluster. So conceptually, the mini cluster is, you know, some number of pods. Normally, flux get is kind of within that broker zero. What if instead we had it be like a sidecar container to the mini cluster? And then you still have your application container level brokers across the pods. So for example, you have a broker that is controlling a container with lamps. You have a different broker with a container that is running stream, which is a memory uh, benchmark, but you don't allow them to schedule anything. You don't let those tunes, they don't know what they're doing. They're going to oversubscribe. You basically disable them from allowing them to schedule. And so here is where a cool service comes in. So if you look at this purple box up here, Flux Sched, this is Fluxion, our scheduler. A couple months ago, I made Fluxion as a service because I thought they would be cool. So the basic idea of this is that it takes the Fluxion Go bindings and then puts them into a separate repository where you can just run it with Go or you can run it in a container. You spin up this container and you get more of a service where you can give it a JSON graph format to create your nodes. You can request allocations. You can cancel them. It is like the core meatiness of the Flux scheduler, just totally separate from Flux. 
So we're gonna take uh, Mr. Cool Men in Black Flexion. We're gonna put him up there. And if you're interested, this is probably way too much detail for this talk. How does this work? Jobs, a particular job. So like I wanna run lamps. This is represented in a JSON format. This is called the job spec. I know that is an overused term. Bash also has a job spec. We call it a job spec too. We then have a plugin that does what's called an allocation bypass. And this is really cool because we add a specific section to our job spec that basically specifies exactly the resources that we want. So what this means in practice is that Fluxion can do all the scheduling for the entire single view of the cluster. We can then put that decision into the job spec and then give the exact job spec to the individual application broker. And the reason this is important, like down to the core, is that even if you were able to kind of give each of those brokers the job spec on the level of a node, because Flux is scheduling down to the most finest granularity of resource, for this example, we can just say that's a core, you know, you could still have a conflict on a node with respect to the cores that are being used. And so this is really cool because it's kind of like doo -doo -doo, orchestrating everything that's going on. So let's take a look at what this what this looks like. Let's take this purple box and zoom in. <laughs> okay, so we submit a job not to one of these brokers, not to Flux Core in a container. We submit it directly to the Fluxion service. We say, okay, I want to run this job with lamps. The Fluxion service has one view of the entire mini cluster. So basically all the single view of all the nodes, not the duplicated one. It figures out the scheduling decision and it gives it exactly to just one of those application container brokers. So in this case, lamps. So then the next question, and this is a question that I ran into as I was designing this, like how do we know when the job is done? Because we still have to coordinate everything right and clean up and like fluxion, you know, there's nothing in there that it will know. Well, I didn't exactly show you the right design here. So what's actually happening is that we have one of those application brokers that I just called the queue. It, it doesn't have anything interesting in the container. It's like Rocky Linux and it has a socket and I called it queue and introducing you to queue. There he is, he's in purple. So what happens, now this is a really cool thing because as I mentioned, we have the entire Flux install that's shared in this empty directory that's shared between the containers within a pod. That means you can go in any container such as Mr. Q and you can look in that empty directory and you see all of the sockets. So all of those local, local zero through three, those are each associated with an application. And then we have a very simple metadata directory as you see below it, that says exactly which application is where. So for example, the local one socket is associated with lamps. And so the queue is basically going to run what I call a fluxion controller which is a silly little Python script at the moment that is orchestrating things. And so what happens is you actually submit the job deflection from this controller. You get back the scheduling decision. The scheduling decision is then given down to the correct broker. And then what happens then is that that fluxion controller is in charge of receiving when the job is actually done, sending it back to the fluxion service to update the graph, and then new work can be come in, can come in and be scheduled across the entire mini cluster. So now we're going to do a quick demo. Alrighty, so that was the demo. I hope that made more sense when you actually see it and you can actually see how incredibly simple it is. So I wanna close and show you this question again. Scheduling is so cool. And when you combine the space of HPC and Kubernetes, and you think of all of these different designs from the kube scheduler to like the middleman, kind of a controller, down to a partition and a mini cluster, and then things you can do inside of a mini cluster partition, there are just so many possibilities. So I hope that you're interested in the space too, and we can work together. If you'd like to reach out to me, I am VSOC on GitHub, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. You can find me in various Slacks. That's my email if you need to reach me. Thanks so much for listening to this very impromptu informal talk. I hope that you enjoyed it and you have a good rest of your day.